Any children who want to be dismissed to go up to be the children's church, uh, please be dismissed at this time. And we can stand together while the children are partying. Let's stand in turn 473, Victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus. I heard an old story. Our Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood. God, our Father, we thank you for the victory that we have in Jesus, that he's indeed plunged us beneath the cleansing flood and granted us the victory, the victory over sin's penalty, the victory over sin's power, and ultimately the victory over sin's presence. We thank you, Lord, that we have the victory in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he strengthens us, he sustains us, he encourages us, he carries us along. And even when we fail to do what we promise to do, we fall short of his righteous standard. Yeah. That his mercy is renewed each morning, his faithfulness is great, and his forgiving grace is bestowed upon us. And we thank you for that, Lord. Right. We pray, Father, that you'd move in our hearts and our minds, our souls and our spirits today. You might speak to us a word that speaks to our lives, where we are, yeah. the issues that we're dealing with. That we might look unto Jesus, the one who's able to help us and to heal us and to restore us. I pray for that person who's maybe never come yeah. to a saving knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That maybe today their ear will be open, their heart and their mind will be receptive to hear the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. How that Christ died for their sin, according to the scripture, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, according to the scripture. And all of those who receive him as their personal savior are forgiven of their sins, yeah. receive the gift of eternal life, and we'll spend all of eternity with God in the future and have the promise of God's presence in the present. Now speak to us, Lord, we may behold, we may hear a great word from God to the end that we'll be encouraged, stirred and moved to go on in Jesus' name. And let the word that your servants mount in the meditations of his heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name. 
that invite us to turn with me to the first chapter of the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, if you may stand while we read the word together. Romans 1, and I would like to watch the look this morning, verses 14 through 17 of Romans 1. And for the sake of context, I will pick up the narrative with verse 8. Romans 1, I'll read verses 8 uh, through and including uh, verse 18. First, I thank my God for Jesus Christ for you all because your faith has been proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in every prayer, making requests. If perhaps now at the last, by the will of God, I may, have, I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you in order that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by other's faith, both yours and mine. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented thus far, in order that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Thus, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. You may be seated. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject of it's time to pay up. It is time to pay up. There's been considerable discussion and debate over in recent months by our leaders in Washington as to what should be done with the national surplus. Should it be returned to us in the form of tax cuts, or should it be applied to our national debt, therefore reducing the national debt? And there have been very eloquent arguments on both sides as to what should be done uh, with the surplus. But the, the truth of the matter is, is that our national debt has been something that has seriously concerned many politicians and economists and even common citizens. The billions of dollars of debt that our nation has, the millions of dollars that's incurred on that debt every single day. Now I don't have the mental capacities to be able to fathom millions of dollars in interest every single day. But I understand that's what's occurred, accrued against the national debt. But in our own personal lives, we understand uh, the problem and the dilemma that is created for us when our outgo exceeds our income. As someone has very aptly said, when our outgo exceeds our income, then our upkeep will ultimately be our downfall. And so we understand the problem that we have when we have more going out than we have coming in, the pressure and the stress that it puts us under as we're trying to make ends meet. And those of you who are excellent uh, in managing your finances, all of you financial wizards that are in here, you've never gotten a letter from a creditor threatening to turn you over to the credit agency. It never happened with First and Grace Bible Church. And none of you have ever been threatened by creditors to garnish your wages. And surely none of you have ever been taken to court for failure to pay a debt because you're a good steward to your wise money manager. But some of us yeah. have had that unenviable uh, plight of having to deal with creditors that were breathing down our throat demanding to be paid. Mm -hmm. The Bible is very clear when it says that the lender is enslaved to the one whom he owes the debt. Or the debt is enslaved to the lender, I should say. A few years ago, my wife and I received an interesting invitation. It's been some time ago. We'd only been married maybe a few months. And we were invited uh, by this good friend to come uh, to her house 
are for a free death. For a free death. I was suspicious from the start. But we got there, and uh, this free dinner that we were going to have, we, there was a person of whom we did not know. And he was the individual that was preparing and that was going to provide this free dinner. He also was a peddler in cookware. And he had a very, very sophisticated and very effective message he had to deliver. Basically what he said, his cookware was so good that when you cooked your food in his cookware, that the food would shrink less. Therefore, you would cook less and you would eat less, and over time, the money that you save in your food bill would actually pay for the $1,500 cookware you wanted to save. <laughs> this is true. I'm not making this up. And so he cooked all this stuff up in this cookware. It didn't taste much different, I mean, than what you normally get at a cheap restaurant. But uh, I was not going to fall for that particular trick. But I was impressed. I was impressed with someone that would be that savvy and they have an argument that was that persuasive. And apparently they, apparently they were able to get a lot of people uh, to buy in to that particular argument. But we know there's no such thing as a free lunch. It's the first thing I learned in economics 101 at Western New Tech. Tax fall, my economics professor said. Tax fall, take no such thing as a free lunch. Everything has a price tag associated. And so we see that in our personal lives, we see that in the church, the life of the church, and we see that as well in our nation. It's so easy for us to operate in the red. It's so easy for us to practice deficit spending, overextending ourselves. Now, I share that by, by way of illustration because I think that is a fitting uh, way of illustrating the problem that we face. The problem we face in our community today, there is a debt that we as the church owe to the community. Amen. And the debt that we owe is a debt of love, Paul says in Romans 13, owe no one but to love him. And the debt that we owe is the debt of discharging the gospel of Jesus Christ, of preaching the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. And our failure to, to pay that debt, our failure to meet the conditions of that debt results in consequences within our society. And so we look at the concern that many have over young people, the growing problems of juvenile crime, and juvenile delinquency, the growing problem of in, uh, sexual impurity among youth is a real problem. And I was just reading this past week for a proposal we were preparing, the statistics, uh, Western State Health Department issued the statistics, real problem of sexually transmitted disease in our state and it's approaching an epidemic. And that gets back, right back to the issue of morality. Amen. And so to teach sex education apart from teaching biblical morality and what God has to say about sex being a sacred thing that God himself has given to the marriage union, to teach it apart from in that context will result most of the time in a proliferation in sexual immorality. And so our failure of the church to, to pay on that debt of teaching people about the Lord Jesus Christ and trying to reach people with the gospel results and consequences in our community. And we have this growing concern about the number of young people getting involved in juvenile crime. A problem with the number of families that are breaking up. Not just poor families, but middle class, upper middle class, wealthy families. Pick up the newspaper and read. That's public. That's the public consumption. It's for public consumption anytime anyone files for a marriage license, any one time anyone files for divorce. So that's in the newspaper. You pick up the newspaper and you see the number of people that are filing for divorce and you recognize some of those names. Fail, our failure to pay the debt results in serious consequences in the society. The only antidote, the only hope for the perils and the problems and the pestilence in our society is confronted with it's the gospel of Jesus Christ yeah. that changes the human heart, that brings a new set of values, a new worldview, a new way of looking at things. Now listen to what I'm, what I'm going to say here, and listen closely. There is a danger, there is a danger to promoting self-esteem and self-actualization apart from sharing the gospel. Yeah. If you keep telling people that they're okay apart from Jesus Christ, if you keep telling them, don't worry about their guilt, don't worry about their sin, don't worry 
about the problem that's going to lie, if you keep telling them that, then they will accommodate to that, and they won't worry about it. And they won't worry about sin. And they won't worry about repenting. And they won't worry about getting right with God. And surely we should teach that we have value as human beings created in the image of God. And everyone has intrinsic value and worth because we are the crown and jewel of God's creation. We are the human race. And we indeed, as, as flawed as it might be, the mark of God is still upon us. And so we can reason and we make decisions and we make choices. And so we ought to teach the value of the individual and the value of the human being and the value of human life and that we have worth and value. But we must not let people conclude that they are all right apart from God. Because they aren't all right. And when we tell people they're all right apart from God, listen to me, then we're actually in conflict with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is trying to convince them and convict them of their sin. The Holy Spirit is trying to get them to realize they need to repent and get right with God. So he's bringing conviction into their heart, and we're telling them don't worry about it. We're in conflict with the Holy Spirit. And so it's, very, it's important that we make sure that when we're sharing with people this idea of a healthy self-image, that we also help them to understand that they can never become all that they were intended to be. They will never reach their full potential apart from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We must not waver and compromise on the exclusivity of the gospel. A couple of weeks ago, I was watching uh, 2020 Prime Time Live, one of those news tabloids. And an interesting story is about the Southern Baptists. The Southern Baptists are known for their evangelistic, for their mission, zeal and their desire to try to win people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So they were doing an investigative story on the Southern Baptists because the Southern Baptists had invited a young Jewish boy to one of the youth meetings and he had made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. So the Southern Baptists were coming under criticism for trying to change people's religion. That they could not find anything wrong with what they had done. Nothing unethical, nothing immoral. As a matter of fact, the parents of the Christians had called the Jewish mother and told her they were inviting her son to a Christian function. But the fact that they were telling these young people they needed to have to be right with God and put their personal faith in Jesus Christ, they were kind of under the system. And 2020 showed up in Texas to criticize them. For, to criticize them for saying that people needed to have Jesus Christ in their heart to be saved. We're a lot closer than what we think to people being intolerant of us as Christians. For people telling us that we should silence our pulpits, quit trying to convert people, let everybody believe what they're going to believe, because if they are sincere, they're going to heaven anyway. We're moving toward that particular time in our country of tolerance at all costs. And those who would dare say that there is some dogmatic truth, those who would dare say that people must repent of their sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are going to be the ones who are criticized as being narrow-minded, religious, bigots, and zealots. And so the preacher, he was very humble and he was very articulate, and he gave, I felt, an apt illustration. He said, do you mean to tell me if people were dying of thirst, and if we had the only source of water, and if we were to keep that water to ourselves, you mean to tell me that y'all would applaud us for that? No, you would not applaud us for that. You would condemn and ridicule us for allowing civilization to die of thirst when we had the water. He says, we have the water. We have the truth of life. We know the truth that changes people's lives because it's changed our lives, and so we cannot be silent. And we cannot allow people to believe whatever they want to believe. We must speak the truth as God has revealed it to us. We must pay the debt that we owe to this society that they don't want to hear. The Apostle Paul understood. The Apostle Paul understood that he was under the compulsion of the Spirit of God to preach the gospel to share the good news, to tell people they could be right with God, their sins could be forgiven, their conscience could be cleansed, they could have a sense of peace and tranquility in their soul. And if you've experienced that, how can you keep it to yourself? How can you keep it? If you have been saved in your sins, if your conscience has been purged, if you have a sense of peace and tranquility, how can you keep it to yourself? It's like the old folk used to say down in the country. I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I just couldn't keep it to myself. I had to tell. I had to gossip the gospel. I had to tell people how 
I felt the sense of peace and security and serenity and purpose and meaning and direction. It's through personal faith in the personal God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul understood that. And so Paul was anxious to get to Rome. Rome, that metropolis, Rome, the capital of the empire. He wanted to get to Rome. Not just so he could show off his intellectual acumen, not so he could show his theological finesse, but he wanted to get there to preach the gospel. Amen. To preach the gospel in this arena of intelligentsia. He wanted to preach the gospel in this place where all of these philosophers were. Paul had an unwavering faith and trust and confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ to arrest men and women and boys and girls, regardless of where they were on the social economic ladder. He believed the up and out and the down and out all need the same message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he was anxious to get to Rome. He couldn't wait to get to Rome. As you read that first chapter, you can sense his intensity, his passion. I want to get to Rome because I want to preach the gospel there to you. And we saw that in verses 8 through 13. But I want to focus for the next uh, 17 minutes on verses 14 through 17. Look at what he says in verse 14. Paul says, I am under obligation. That is the literal translation. The King James says, I am a debtor. The literal translation of the word debtor is to be under obligation. It could be referred to a financial obligation that you are under. If you have incurred debt, you are now under obligation to pay that debt, to be under obligation. Paul says, I am under obligation. And what he in essence was saying, I sense a solemn responsibility. A solemn responsibility. He says, I sense a solemn responsibility. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarian, both to the wise and to the foolish. Paul was an equal opportunity preacher. He didn't change his message. He did not dilute his message. He did not try to make his message more palatable to people. He had the same message. He says, I am under obligation. I sense a solemn responsibility to the Greeks. And when he used the term Greek, he used it to refer to those who had intelligence, the bright, the fairest. The philosophers, many of the great philosophers of the Greco Empire were still influencing Roman thought. And so Paul says, I am under obligation, I sense a solemn responsibility to preach the gospel to those who have an IQ of 250. To those who consider themselves to be the intellectual brain trust of the society. Paul says, I feel compelled, I am responsible to preach the gospel to them because regardless of how high their IQ is, without Jesus Christ, they're lost. They're intelligently lost. He says, I sent a solemn responsibility to the Greek and also so to the barbarians at the complete opposite end of the spectrum. The barbarian, the uncouth, the uncivilized, those who are past being criminals, but those who are uncivilized, Paul says the gospel of Jesus Christ can bring civility to the uncivilized. Yeah, and there are missionaries that can testify to that. There are missionaries who have gone into foreign countries in the bush where cannibals existed, where people were carnivorous and they would eat human flesh, and they've taken down the gospel of Jesus Christ and to the barbaric and civilized civility and order has come to place in those places. Yeah. It is the power of the gospel. There is no other message like the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the reason there is no other message like the gospel of Jesus Christ is because there is no other mechanism for the dissemination of the gospel like God has given to the gospel. Let me explain to you what I mean. In communication, in communication, you need an, an encoder, you need a transmitter, you need a receiver, and then you need a decoder on the other end. That is basically any type of communication that you do. If you're communicating with someone through email, you have to encode the information to the community, computer. Then you need a transmitter, the internet line, which transmits that, translate that message. It transmits the message. At the other end, you need a receiver, another PC that can receive that message. They have the software to take that message in. 
And once it is received, it has to be able to, de to decode the message to where it can be understood. That is basic to any type of communication, oral, oral communication, written communication, no matter what it is. The uniqueness of the gospel is that the encoder is the Holy Spirit. He encodes the message into the men and the women of God. But not only is the Holy Spirit the encoder, he's also the transmitter of the message. He then transmit the message to the other end. But he also shows up at the other end, he's the receiver of the message. He receives the message at the other end, he then decodes the message for the hearer and interprets the message to the hearer. That's why there will never be a replacement for preaching and declaring the gospel, never. Because God has not promised to bless any other form of communication the way he's promised to bless the preaching of his word. He says, my word will not return unto me void or empty. Why? Because I'm going to encode it, I'm going to transmit it, I'm going to decode it, I'm going to interpret it, I'm going to make sure that it finds lodge in the hearts and minds of people. That's why I have total confidence in the gospel. I stake my life on the gospel, my destiny on the gospel of Jesus Christ, my soul on the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it changed my raggedy life one day, and I've seen it do the same thing for other people. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is why I sense a solemn responsibility to herald this gospel, to discharge this gospel with great boldness and with great confidence because I know that God the Holy Spirit will transmit that message and God the Holy Spirit will take that message to the right hearts to receive it with gladness and people will be saved. I guarantee you, if you make it a practice of your life, to establish relationships where you can share with people how God saved your soul and what God is doing in your life. I guarantee you God will use you to bring people to saving faith in Jesus Christ. There are people out there who don't even know it yet, but they have already been selected and chosen by God to salvation. And time will bring it to pass as messengers of this good news share this word. Paul said, I sense a solemn responsibility. It doesn't matter how smart people are. I'm not intimidated by intelligent people. My IQ really isn't that high. I read a lot. I can memorize things, but my IQ really isn't that high. But I'm not intimidated by people with high IQs and a lot of degrees behind their name because I know in whom I have to live. And I know what he has done in my life. And I know his power to change people's lives. And wherever God places you, God qualifies. So you don't apologize for being where God places you. Because he qualified you to be there as his ambassador, as his messenger to bring to bear his standards and his word on the situation. And with great confidence and great boldness, boldness, but with great humility because you know it's not because of you. Not by your own work, your finance, your intelligence, your business ability to decipher and understand, but the spirit of God shows to open your dark, blinded eyes and show you the truth. Bring that truth and deposit it in your soul. And then you become a custodian of God's truth, a dispenser of the good news of the gospel. And so Paul says it'll work for everybody. It will work for everybody, for the Greek, for the barbarian, for the wise, and for the unwise, for the foolish, for the ignorant, for the unlearned. It will work for everybody. Because God is an equal opportunity saying. And it's whosoever will, let him come. And drink of the water of life freely. When we as Christians realize that God has indeed entrusted to us his very power that he wants to unleash to bring salvation, then we will turn our respective communities upside down by the power of God. So Paul says that I am a debtor. I am under obligation. I have a solemn responsibility of which I cannot escape. I cannot be relieved from it. I am under this burden. I'm under this obligation. And as long as there's breath in my life, Paul says, I am responsible to discharge this good news. Amen. Not only Paul said he sensed a solemn responsibility, but he also had a swift readiness. A solemn responsibility and a swift readiness. Look at what else he says. Verse 15. Thus for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. 
a solemn responsibility and a swift readiness. Paul said, I am eager to do it. I don't have to be begged or plead or persuaded to do it. I don't have to be paid to do it. Paul said, I am swiftly ready to do it. I'm eager to do it because I've sanctified the Lord God in my heart. And I'm ready to give people a reason for the hope that I have of meekness and fear. A swift readiness at the heart of all, this chicken at the heart of all Christian servants. Now we can excuse ourselves from a lot of things. We can excuse ourselves. Well, I'm not gifted to teach. I can't teach things. We can excuse ourselves and say, well, I'm not gifted in this particular area, so I can excuse myself. I can't sing, so I can excuse myself from the choir. I can't sm smile consistently, and so I can't be uh, on the usher board or one of the greeters. We can excuse ourselves from a lot of things. But when it comes to sharing our faith, no excuses. No excuses. No acceptable excuses. My good friend, Al Perry, used to always share with me. We'd be going through difficult times, you know, I would cry on his shoulder. He said, look, remember, no one ever said that life would be fair. So don't be disappointed when it isn't. Second, anything worth accomplishing will always have opposition to it. Anything of value and significance, the enemy is going to raise up his head and try to impede the progress. And thirdly, he would say, remember this, there ain't no such thing as a good excuse. That's an oxymoron. Good and excuse cannot be in the same sentence together because they're mutually exclusive. You cannot have a good excuse. So don't fabricate. And so we don't have no excuses for not sharing our faith. If we've been saved, if we've been delivered, we know that our names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. So we should sense a solemn responsibility. Let's be a swift readiness about it. We see people moving around. It's lost people moving toward a Christless eternity. And so we're eager to share this good news of the gospel of the grace of God. You see, we need to learn to abandon ourselves to the Holy Spirit. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to take hold of our lives and, and use us in risky situations. Most of us want to live too close to the best. We never want to step out beyond what we know that we can do in our own ability, skill, and finesse. We don't want to do anything that will cause people to recoil or to pull back from us. But when we abandon ourselves to the Holy Spirit, we find ourselves saying things and doing things that we just wouldn't say or do in the natural. We find ourselves leaping tall spiritual builds by the power of God. We find ourselves standing up and saying what needs to be said, even in hostile arenas where there's conflict and opposition, because we know that God is with us. Abandon yourself to the Holy Spirit. Allow him to use you. And there'll be a sense of exuberance and exhilaration. There'll be a sense of being a part of something significant, great, and grand. If you sense this solemn responsibility and swift readiness to do what God has called you to do. And lastly, not only Paul said that he sensed a solemn responsibility and a swift readiness, but the Apostle Paul said with great confidence, because I have a saving remedy. I have a saving remedy. Verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's stop right there as we will bring our thoughts to a close. Paul said that he was not ashamed of the gospel. That's an interesting word there in the Greek. It carries the idea of having feelings of, of fear or shame that prevents you from doing what you know you need to do. It is the feelings of fear and shame that prevents you from doing what you know you need to do. Remember in 2 Timothy 2, 12, Paul, Paul told Timothy, don't be ashamed of the gospel. And don't be ashamed of me, God's preacher. Don't be ashamed, Timothy. Don't have this fear and timidity because God is not the author of fear. He's not giving us the spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind. Paul says, I am not ashamed. I do not sense any fear. There's no timidity about me sharing this gospel. 
This word that is used for shame is an interesting word. If you have a vine, a expository, a dictionary, New Testament words, you do a word study on this word of shame. It's the same word that the writer of Hebrews uses in Hebrews 2.11 when it says that Christ is not ashamed to call us his brothers. It's the same word that the writer of Hebrews used in Hebrews 11.16 when he says God is not ashamed to be called our God. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because Jesus is not ashamed to call me his brother. And God is not ashamed to be called my God. Now, if Jesus is going to be not ashamed to be my elder brother, I know that he will defend me and take up for me. If God is not ashamed to be called my God, I know that he will be able to supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So I will not be ashamed of this gospel. I will not be ashamed of this gospel. I will not have fear and trepidation and intimidation about sharing this gospel. And whatever arena I might have to share it. People might laugh at me and they might mock me and they might say that I'm never minded, that I'm not very deep in my thinking, but Paul said, I will not be ashamed. Yeah. I'm not ashamed. Right. Why, Paul? Because I got to say to him, I'm not ashamed to say of this gospel. And there are four interesting words Paul uses to tell why he's not ashamed. First of all, he says, I am not ashamed of this gospel because it is the gospel, it is the good news. And he says, for it is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The word dynamite is derived from the word dunamis in the Greek. It means inherent power. Dynamite has power within itself. You see, when you light the match, that does not give the dynamite power. The power is inherent in the dynamite. All the match does is serve as the spark to ignite the power that's already there. The gospel of Jesus Christ has inherent power. I don't give it power no matter how hard I preach, how loud I talk, how much I perspire. That doesn't give the gospel power. It has power in and of itself. It is inherent power. It is the power of God under salvation. Power is within the gospel, the message itself. That's why you do not have to be a silver tongue orator to share it. You can stutter, you can bust up the king's language with these and that and this and this and and ain'ts and buts, because the power is not in the eloquence of your speech. The power is in the gospel. That's why Paul said, when I came to you, I did not come in excellency of speech. I don't want you to be impressed with my diction, Paul said. I came in simplicity of words that you might know that the excellence of the power is of God and not of us. Amen. This gospel has inherent power in it. It is the dynamite of God under salvation. To everybody that believes in the Jew first and also the Greek. Resident inside of you, you are the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings the message of the gospel. The dynamite of God is inside of you. All you have to do is to trust God and believe Him, and as you open your mouth and share the good news of the gospel, the grace of God, that the Holy Spirit will serve as the ignition source, and He will ignite that dynamite and explode in people's lives, bring about salvation. He said, "I got a saving remedy. I got a saving remedy. It is the gospel of God. It is the power of God." Unto salvation, Paul said. Not unto just possibility thinking. Not just unto a wishful experience. But unto salvation. The word salvation here, it carries the idea of being delivered. Of being rescued from danger. Paul says the gospel of God is the power of God to deliver and to rescue us from danger. It delivers us from the penalty of sin. For the wage of sin is death. But the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, it delivers us from the penalty of sin. It delivers us from the power of sin because we've been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Jesus prayed in John 17, Lord, sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is true. The gospel, it sanctifies us. It cleanses us. The gospel is more effective than tithe, than bleach, than Ajax to sanctify our lives and to cleanse our lives and to set us apart for, for, for God's service. But not only does it deliver us from the penalty of sin and the power of sin, but hallelujah, praise his holy name. And after a while, the vine by it's going to deliver us from the very presence of sin. Oh yeah, there is a heaven after a while and by and by. There is a beautiful land where the wicked cease from trumpet and where the weary is at rest, where the left and the lamb lay down together and we study war no more. There is a place where we're brute beat our shares and our, our, our spirits and the, the plow shares and our swords and the pruning hooks. There is a place. I long for that place. Beulah land, that place where the streets are like pure gold, that place where there's a river that burns a river of life, and the tree of life is in the midst of her. I live and I long for that place. It's the power of God and the salvation. Oh, the 
the best is yet to come. Oh, the best is yet to come. We, we haven't seen anything down here yet that God throws his party when we get up there. The best is yet to come. But keep on laboring, children. Keep on serving God. Keep on having a sense of a solemn responsibility, a swift readiness, recognize that you have the saving remedy to change people's lives with the gospel of God. So as I close, Paul says, the saving remedy of which I am not ashamed is the gospel, the good news, the dynamite of God for salvation, deliverance from the penalty, power, and ultimate presence of sin to everyone, he says, to everyone who believes, to everyone who believes. Conjure up in your mind. The most evil, wicked, mean person that you can imagine. The gospel has inherent power to save that individual if they will believe. That is the power of the gospel. It saves everyone who believes because in it, the righteousness of God is unveiled. Amen. In the gospel, God's righteousness is unveiled. It is revealed. We see how righteous God is. God is so righteous that before he could forgive one sin, he had to provide a perfect sacrifice. God is so righteous that he allowed his only God son to be beaten and battered, manhandled and mauled, spit up and crucified naked in the public square and to shed his blood as if he were a son. Because on that cross he became a son. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5 22, for God has made him Christ to become sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. He is so righteous that he requires that sin be punished. He is so righteous that he will only accept a perfect sacrifice for sin. And those who would say that we're all going to heaven as long as we're sincere may be sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. God is so righteous that he's made one way. Why would God want to confuse people a whole lot of ways? Now, he's so righteous, he provided one way to heaven. And a fool, a wayfaring man, does not have to miss it. Anyone who ends up in hell will be there because of their own choice, their own negligence to respond to the gospel. Well, if you're here this morning, maybe God has spoken to your heart. And maybe you know. Deep down within, you know that you're not right.